What's up there everyone, welcome here to another video on my YouTube channel. This video and the topic, suicide, it's been so long on my mind to talk about it. And today, let's talk about it. Let me go a little bit over the structure of how this video, what, what this video contains and also why I am making this video and who am I to talk about this topic. Let me answer that question first. So I've struggled in the past between the age of 12 to 18 for six years with suicidal thoughts. So I have experience. <laughs> so weird to say but i yeah i have personal experience on the topic of suicide but then also i'm the founder of the ips project which is an educational platform on life where we do a lot of work around providing info on topics that we don't learn much about or anything at all in schools like mental health the mind relationships i professionally do work I do a lot of work around mental health. I'm also a licensed trauma therapist and I have also volunteered for the suicide line. So I also have experience there. So I have in a couple of ways, some experience that I feel that I can definitely provide something useful to you. You know how in schools you get like first aid learns. I mean, it's not like, that crazy you know or that many hours that you get it but at least you learn a little bit a little bit in schools about first aid we know nothing on how to emotionally help someone we don't we learn nothing about the f emotional first aid which is much more common than the physical first aid when i was actually doing the training to be a volunteer on the suicide line in one of the first lessons that we were having i was really sitting there hearing this information and I was really thinking to myself, damn it, like people should hear this. Like people should have this training. People should know more about how to emotionally help someone. And I want to provide that here in this video. Suicide is really the bottom, you know? So many of the things that you're gonna learn here can be applied to less severe or, or less life-threatening emotional wounds. With that, I actually also wanna say Thank you, you know, thank you so much, whoever you are, whoever is watching this video, even if it's just a few people, thank you so much for watching this video, because I have a lot of respect for people like you. It means, you know, it's people like you who care about others and who care about wanting to help others that make this whole world good, that make this whole world livable. So. Thank you for being such a person, you know. Now, let me take a second here to go over the structure of this video because in the description I will put timestamps so you can go to a specific point in this video uh, when you need to revision it and you want to hear something back. Or if you want to go right now to a particular part that you are mostly looking information on, uh, you can do that in the description uh, so you can find the timestamps there. Uh, however, if I could recommend you to watch this whole video, then I would totally recommend you to do that. Just because there's so many things on this topic. And even if you think this video is quite long, it, yeah, it's not that long for the amount of depth that suicides and the, the complexity and, and, and yeah. So, but I try to put the essential things in here. So that's why I would recommend you to really watch this whole video because there's quite a lot of really fundamental, important things that I'm gonna cover here in this video. But either way, like I said, in the description, you can find timestamps to go to specific points in this video. I first wanna start actually with the top three often asked questions that I get when I tell people that I used to struggle with those thoughts. And in each question that I'm gonna answer, I also wanna provide useful information, right? To better understand suicide. After that, I wanna go into the actually how to help someone. I actually wanna share with you what I learned for the suicide line, things that you should definitely do things that you should definitely not do and give you just uh, some actionable steps on how to approach someone uh, and how to really help 
someone actually. So that's the structure. Again, like I said, the timestamps can be found in a description and talking about the description because we do so much work on the IPS project around mental health. Uh, we got a podcast there where I interview with psychologists, neuroscientists, you know, people from all walks of life to really draw out life lessons from just a variety of different people. But I have there also talk with Mark Henning, uh, and he's a mental health advocate, and he has the most watched TEDx talk on suicide. He himself struggled with suicides uh, for a lot of years. So he's not someone just alone professionally who knows what he's talking about, because he's a mental health advocate, but he also has the personal experience. And so I can highly recommend you to also watch or to also listen to that episode as so much more information about it can be found there. Uh, and it's about an hour long, so it goes quite in depth. And there's other people that I've interviewed on a podcast that either are, that are that's gonna be very helpful resources to better understand this topic and better help whoever you wanna help. Uh, as Stephen Lewis, who is a, a researcher on self-injury, you know, self-injury is many times one of the coping ways when you're st- when you're dealing with a lot of emotional pain, it's one of the ways to actually make emotional pain to physical pain. And, you know, there's other coping ways like alcohol, drugs. Self-injury is quite a misunderstood topic, actually, of why people use it. And it's as a way to regulate your emotions. And when you are suicidal, when you're consumed with those thoughts, it's a great amount of emotional pain is happening inside you, right? And self-injury, many times, I'm not saying for everyone, it's one of the coping ways many times to deal with emotional pain. So Stephen Lewis is also someone who has personal experience with it, with that topic. He also did a, an incredible good TEDx talk on that topic. And then I interviewed him also on the IPS podcast, which was an incredible episode. So those are just two people that I that I could highly recommend to listen to. So just to say, do definitely have a look at the description of this video because some really, some other really helpful resources on the topic of, of suicide and understanding it and how to better help someone will be found there. So check it out. And then a last, but last thing that I wanna mention, that I wanna drop here is that the suicide line it's not just alone there for people who are thinking of suicides, but it's also there for people who want more information, right? You can totally call them for that reason too. If you need more like really customized answer, then I would really recommend you to also call the suicide line. The people there are really well trained. So you're gonna get some really good information when you would call to the suicide line. And you know, the suicide line is free, so it's not something that I'm promoting here or anything. It's just completely free. And in the description, I will also put a link to all the numbers of all the suicide lines in the whole world. So. You can find it there. Uh, having said that also, I, with each video here on my YouTube channel, I always try to to comment on as many comments as I can. With this one in particular, I will even more be active on this video uh, and answering comments. So if you have any other questions or if anything in the video was not so clear or anything, right? Just put a comment down below in, in this video and I will I will reply back. <laughs> Having said all that, that intro there, let's dig into now uh, the video actually. The first question that I get the most often asked is just plain simply. This is such a difficult question to answer. You know, just as how under the right ingredients, everyone can get a cold or a fever. It could be that you haven't slept uh, enough and you might have experienced a lot of stress under a long period of time, which might be the reason why you didn't sleep a lot, right? Uh, It might be cold and rainy outside. Those could be a couple of ingredients of how you could get a cold or a fever, for example. And the same with suicide, like while the story of how that person started to have those thoughts is quite different for everyone, the ingredients are quite the same for everyone, right? And I'm gonna take you now to the past and take out those ingredients. And it's not gonna be all the ingredients, right? That that there's other ones, right? That 
are a factor of why someone has suicidal thoughts, but there's quite some of the most common ingredients in my past that contribute to quite a lot of people in, in developing those thoughts. Uh, let's start at the beginning, which is by losing my dad at the age of three years old. <clears throat> and basically, being a, tra <laughs> a licensed trauma therapist, trauma, and especially developmental trauma, so childhood trauma, when trauma happens in your childhood, it makes you more prone to suicidal thoughts. And in the research that they've done is, you know, when you look at people who who committed suicide and you look back at their past, many times they went through something traumatic in their childhood. That's one factor, right? Something traumatic, going through something traumatic. But then, of course, also not just having a parent, losing one of your parents and the instability that it brings. It definitely contributes uh, to the suicidal thoughts and to the actually attempting of suicide, which, I'm, which I'll explain uh, a bit later. But high school, you know, is where things really got went down um, dramatically. High school felt like a prison to me. Stand up, go to school, do homework, go to bed, and repeat that. And then the topics that were being taught didn't interest me too much. The professions that were shown that I could become really didn't speak to me at all. Life to me felt very boring, and it was boring. It really was boring back then. And so my interest in life kind of lowered and then my grades also started lowering and then I started to become a bad student and with that I felt that I was a bad person because teachers started to, to not care too much about me. But then also a big major contributor to all this is sleep. You know how people tell you that sleep is important but no one really tells you how important it is? And a book that really shocked me is the book Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. You could summarize the book in just one sentence, that sleep is important, but you really need to read the full book to really grasp on how important it is. And I'm a night person. And if you don't believe me, like, it's really, a th like, it is a thing. Like, in, and in the book, they also talk about that. Like, some people are night persons, some people are morning people, and then you have some percentage of people who are like kind of in the middle there. But naturally, I tend to gravitate more towards th the nights. But so being a night person and having to wake up quite early and then not having too much of an interest just in school, I used to play just video games, games up until 3 or 4 a.m. You know, I'm not just saying once in a while, like I'm, I'm pre pretty much every day I was doing that. Because uh, it was my escape, my way of coping with with this world and with the boredom that I was experiencing. I really slept three to four hours max every every day for six years. You know how when you sleep one hour less or two hours, you get more emotional, you feel like less balanced, you get more easily angry or sad. Imagine doing that, you know, imagine having four or three hours less of sleep for years. I was sleep deprived for years. Suicidal thoughts when you are sleep deprived increase. And they've also shown showed in the book and explained in the book that they've done research on that. You get more easily suicidal thoughts or those thoughts start to develop when you're getting sleep deprived. And so that was actually also a, a big contributor to the thoughts and to the development of them. After a while you get in, in, in a hole, you know, you, you, you really fall into a hole. And I do remember that I once tried to approach a teacher and, and, and I guess you don't have, this is the problem also that you don't at that age learn how to give those feelings words. So, and then of course, if you're like guys in general tend to talk way less about their feelings. But so I, I do remember trying to talk to a teacher and trying to say, I don't feel good. And nothing has ever been done on it. When that happens, I also started feeling, okay, <laughs> no one actually cares how I feel. Uh, and then you don't really know who you can trust. You don't know if you're the only one that's feeling something happening inside and you don't have the words to really explain what is happening. I don't know if you could start to see 
you know, this this pile just slowly building up and building up. And then there were like other things like being a short guy, which I mean, I've made a video actually here on my YouTube channel also on, on being a short guy and just where I provide tips. And in a couple of months, it blew up to over 15,000 views. Being short as a guy is not fun. It's not a thing that you should be. So it definitely lowered my self-esteem and just how I thought of me. And then other things like having a chronic heart disease. Back then it really felt like a weakness. And especially when they talk about it, like, oh, you can't do that, you can't do that, this and that. like. So you start to get this really strange picture of yourself. Then, you know, when you don't have any solution and the thoughts just keep building up and keep building up and the pain, you know, just keeps building and building and building and there's no end to it all your brain naturally starts to look for a solution. And one of those solutions, when there is no other solution, is to press the self-destruct button. And yeah, that's what happens. And that is where it isn't helpful when you lost someone. Because I felt no one around me understood me or that no one cared. But I always felt like my dad, you know, he would understand me. And so... It was a huge motivator, besides the emotional pain and wanting to end it. Thoughts kept developing, thoughts that over the years started becoming plans, plans that become very well thought out plans, and then plans that that went to to um, execution and to yeah. Together with this question of you know why, a lot of times also the why didn't you come. You know, that question comes together with, with that one. You know, on that moment when, you know, I stood there to take my own life, I actually got so scared of myself. You know, like, I just terrified of myself because that was the first time that I really realized, fuck, <laughs> I'm really lost. And it was sort of like a wake-up slap in my face, like a shock. But it was just a shock like, wow, I really 100% could kill myself now. And that actually stopped me, um, that shock and that realization, that little moment of clarity of, wow, what am I doing right now? Like, this is crazy. And it's actually from that moment on that I literally, a switch clicked over. And then I, after that, went and traveled around the world for three years, which was really, what, yeah, what opened my eyes. Uh, and then after that, I started the IPS project, and it's been an incredible journey of healing, but it took a long time. So that's just a little insight of some of those ingredients, and how slowly things start to build up, and when there's never a solution or any other way, you get suicidal thoughts. It's actually quite natural to start having those thoughts when you're stuck and there's no end to it. Let me also just um, put here, before we move to the second part of this video, let me here show you actually an illustration. And this one is actually taken from the website of the suicide line uh, here in Belgium. So yes, these are Flemish words, but I will, <laughs> I will translate them. So the red dots, is the reasons why people have suicidal thoughts. The blue ones I'm gonna cover later actually in this in this video. The biggest one here that you can see, right, this one, it's loneliness. Loneliness is 73, you know, percent. It's really the biggest one. And if you look now at what I shared, you can see like loneliness really was a dominant factor there too. Losing your parents, feeling like there's no one, feeling like a misfit, just feeling lonely, right? And that's really on the suicide line. Loneliness is the biggest reason. The second biggest one here that you can see, break up loving someone. It cuts deep, does a lot of pain uh, to someone and you know, Breakup and loneliness kind of go hand in hand, right? Uh, but that's 21%, uh, so that's also quite a big one. Uh, and then another big one here, that's actually losing someone. The same like a breakup, you know? 
loneliness and losing someone go very much hand in hand. Now, then you have also struggling with a mental illness. So that's 17%. You're struggling with depression or if you're like schizophrenia or any other personality disorder. You have definitely some imbalance going on. It's quite a lot of emotional pain that those people are bearing and suicides can definitely, yeah, come to be a solution. Uh, and then here, 12 or let's say 13% is uh, financial problems. The stress that finances bring is tremendous. So it's actually no surprise that it, it, it is in here, right? So those five are the biggest ones uh, where loneliness is again, the most dominating one. Uh, but then, I mean, it's not the only ones, right? Because you also have here like bullying, abuse, um, problems in work and studying. And then uh, literally translated, this is rational conflict, overthinking definitely can put you into a downward spiral where you lose kind of the point of living. Mainly wanted to show you this here, the reasons of uh, why people call to the suicide line. Now, the last thing that I want to show before we move to the second part here of this video is to explain this illustration here. Because, you know, you could say like six years is quite long, but actually it's very normal that it takes multiple months, multiple years from thought to suicide. It can literally take multiple years. So it's not that abnormal that it's, that it's six years. It can be definitely longer too. So let's translate again here. So this is the invisible signals, right? As you can see, what's underneath the water, you can see that, but it's there. And this here are the visible signals, right? Thoughts, can't see that, but they're there. And quite early, actually, when someone is having thoughts, you can pick up signals. So what you can see here then is signal or signals. That's visible, that's visible, but you just have to know the signals. And many people don't know the signals. One of the signals, for example, when you look back at my story, I said that I used to be a good student uh, in primary school, but then in high school, I became a very bad student. That's quite a signal actually, that when there's dramatic change in something, as having good points, having being the worst, being just really bad. So behavior change is another one. So someone who is, for example, very soft, you know, has, has a, or kind, let's put that word. Uh, so someone who's very kind and very warm. Uh, so let's also put warm. All of a sudden, you know, being someone who's very angry all the time and just where a lot of hate just kind of comes from. So a mood change or a behavior change as being very warm to being very cold when there's an extreme like that, right? Another one is actually appearance change, you know, and that could be, for example, someone who just has normal healthy body to becoming very, very thin or very overweight. Uh, but it could also be clothes style, for example, from someone who just used to wear normal, you know, I mean, like colorful clothes to wearing very dark clothes all of a sudden. Uh, many times our clothing also kind of reflects how we're feeling. And then there's also signals, like indirect signals, uh, for example, where they say with words, it's better that I'm not here, or I sh like, it's the world is better without me. You know, that's an indirect way of trying to say like, yeah, I kind of, I don't want to be here anymore. Uh, and then of course you have a direct way where they just say like, I want to die. Uh, I want to kill myself. When someone is saying that, or when you notice a be behavior change, or when you notice an appearance change, and like a dramatic one, right? Like an extreme one from, from like, yeah, like when they were kind and warm to being very cold and very drawn back from people where they used to be like very open or something. Or, or like what I said with like in school when when that person used to have good grades and all of a sudden has like really bad grades, there's a reason behind that. And that are signals that you can take note of. Also, there was other signals like when they all of a sudden start drinking very heavily 
or or abusing drugs or when they start tar- start doing self injury when they start cutting themselves you know those are those are signals that you really got to take note of and you can't see them let's just change colors here for a second uh, to make this all a better overview so dots so once the the signals have been shown concrete plan starts to develop so you got plan and then there's actually an attempt it's many times the first attempt that people don't contune because they are like not yet that down many times they can still kind of withstand the temptation to do contune and to do take their own life if they never figure out another solution and the emotional pain just be yeah it just stays um or becomes so unbearable suicide definitely happens i could show you now that this can really overstretch off for example one year two years to let's say three years now so this whole process of what you see here now can really go over a stretch of years you know you don't just have one day suicidal thoughts and you don't just commit or kill yourself the day after you know those thoughts build up so that's the first question here Uh, i know it's quite a lengthy answer but i hope quite some good info already here has been answered in that first question now let's move on to the next question In so many of the interviews that I've done, this question always comes up. What you mainly got to understand here is that it's a very hard question because no one always feels good. And it's not per se when you know that someone is struggling with suicidal thoughts or that person is sort of getting out of that and is doing better, but all of a sudden feels less good, that that's unnatural because it's very natural to feel bad at times in life. All the emotions from the the positive ones to the negative ones, they all have a function. And the goal in life is not to get rid of the negative ones because that's, that's not healthy. Because you need those as indicators. When you feel lonely, you need to feel that to go outside and to actually search and find or to get social contact right you need those you you need both the good and the bad ones so do i feel good i feel great you know i feel good the majority of the time i feel good but there is the healthy dose of the unhappy days the main thing what you gotta look for when you ask that question to someone is do they for the majority of the time feel good and here's why it's important to take note of that that, you know, to search for is that person in balance, right? And, you know, majority of the time feeling good, but also feeling, you know, unhappy days. Because if it is someone that you know has struggled with suicidal thoughts and is now like out of it, you could say, or, you know, less feeling feeling suicidal, and you ask that person to check in, and that person is answering with an extreme of like, oh, I feel amazing, I feel great, I've never felt so good in my life. That could be a mask. Because the both extremes are never healthy. You know, the both extreme happiness or the both extreme unhappiness are not healthy. You might be suppressing the negative emotions and be pretending that you're all the time happy. And that's why I wanna wanna put that out, because It can be used as a mask, actually, for people to say that they're doing extremely good, you know, when they go to that extreme version of always saying that whenever you ask that. It might be that they're actually still struggling because they're hiding, and that's why they're going to the extreme to try to hide that. The last question that I get often, most often asked is, when a majority of your life you spend thinking about suicide, it's very common for those thoughts to come into your head again. Uh, And not in a way, you know, not a mistake, not in a way that I think about committing suicide or that I think about that I have suicidal intents. Not in that way, but just just suicide. It's just been so many years a part of my life 
those having those thoughts that it just very easily just enters my thoughts again because it's been so many years in my head. Mainly I wanna wanna underscore here with answering this question, do check in with people who used to struggle with suicidal thoughts. How do they think about suicide now? You know, are they do they just think about the topic once in a while or or can you sense that they're still that those thoughts are really dominating them still and that the thoughts are still developing into something more than just thoughts alone because it's not because once you got out of those thoughts that you can never you know fall into that hole again so it is good to check in with people uh you know when you do know that they struggle with that and then search for what i hopefully you know was able to clarify here with that question I'm gonna teach you now some techniques and tools that I learned uh, in the suicide line. So let's go and get to it. To understand the steps on how to help someone, it was shown us, shown to us through the, the following uh, drawing. So basically, you got a hole, and you know the person struggling with suicidal thoughts is stuck inside the hole. And you are here on top. And you can see that person there, right? Uh, with those thoughts. Now, to really understand that person, you gotta go down and meet that person where he or she is to really see and understand that person, right? And it's only through understanding someone that you can also help someone and that you can eventually go here, up, out, right? The first part here, and for almost everyone, you know, when we did our training, this was the most shocking thing. And I'm sure for many people watching, it will also be quite shocking. When you are, you know, calling, when, when you're on a phone call, one of the first things is to actually name suicide. So to actually drop the word. On the suicide line, it will go something like this, right? Person calling, saying, hello, I don't know why I'm calling, but I'm just feeling, I just feel terrible. And you would respond in a way of, I hear you say that you're feeling terrible. Does this also mean that you're feeling or that you're thinking of suicide? It's dropping that big and heavy word in the first part of the call and of the conversation. So what I would suggest to you, if you know someone who is struggling or that you think is struggling with suicidal thoughts, you know, sit down with that person and simply ask, simply ask, you know, I feel like you're struggling with something. You know, are you thinking of, of suicide? But it's so important and don't wait half an hour in the conversation, but it's so important to drop it in the beginning so the word is set and so you can actually talk about you know, about suicide. So you don't have to first wait half an hour before you talk about it. And so you don't have to wait half an hour to get to the point of trying to understand why that person is struggling with those thoughts. So first step, naming suicide. Then the second step is the acuteness. And what that basically means is that once, you know, I'm going back to the, to the suicide line and on a call, right? So you drop suicide, you drop the words, is to basically understand how much that person is thinking about suicide. You know, how how far are they? Like, do they have plans? Do they think a lot about it? How you can measure that is by asking questions, right? And some of those questions are, how many times do you think about suicide? You know, do you think often about it? So, or another one could be, do you have concrete plans? And another question could be, do you see yourself committing suicide? 
Um, these are just a few. In the description, I will write out a whole bunch more of questions that you can ask about the acuteness and about the other steps that we're gonna look into now as well. So, you know, do definitely check the description. And then here in the bottom is the why, is the what they seek in suicide. Uh, and now that I'm just, cause I will in a minute also talk about do's and do nots when you are doing this. Uh, now I just kind of want to go over this drawing uh, and then go more in depth uh, into it with the do's and the do nots when you're having that conversation. So, you know, the third step after naming suicides, after measuring the acuteness is trying to understand the reason why they have those thoughts, you know, what do they seek in suicide? What does suicide mean to them? Uh, and then you are after that sort of building more up to getting out. So to the solution more. So here it would be the reason of why they're still alive. You know, what is the reason that they're still here? So often when you on a call, you know, and, and you would get to that point, uh, it will be, for example, uh, their children that they don't want to leave behind or, or their partner or their parents. Uh, that's the reason of living. The last sort of part here is solution. So the solution of what they can do now. And that's basically it. Like after that, like you can't drag someone out all the way out of the hole. Basically, once you have provided or once you have talked about a solution or steps that they can do, they have to take those steps themselves. And this is sort of as a, as a therapist, that is also something that you got to understand that you cannot change people. They got to want to change themselves. So motivation has to come from them. It has to come from inside. You can force someone to change, right? But then they change because you force them to change and not because they want to change. All right, let's go over the do's and do nots. Let's start first with the do nots. First of all, do not minimize. When you are here trying to understand this person and that person is opening up to you uh, and sharing some of what he or she is going through, do not minimize by saying, you know, like, oh, that sounds a little bit difficult, yes. Or, oh, you might, you must be going a little bit through a rough time. Do not use words like that because it, it will come across to that person that, that what he or she is saying isn't taken very serious or that it doesn't matter too much because you're minimizing the seriousness of it. Even if to you, it might not sound that big of a deal, whatever they're going through, right? Do not minimize, do not use any of those words that minimize the seriousness and, and you know, the struggle that is not easy for them. The second one, and you see this so often you see this so often do not inflict guilt do not say think about you know your parents what would they think if you're gone or you know think about your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your sister or your brother or whoever right but do not say that and i understand the intent might be well meant but what you do when you do when you say that is that you inflict guilt on that person and it also comes across to that person that they can talk about these thoughts to you with the result that they might completely shut off and not open up to you anymore. And even in the worst case to no one, it's not helpful. It's really not helpful. So do not inflict guilt by saying that when that person is opening up to you and, and trying to explain to you what they're going through. Just listen, do not try to inflict anything and especially not guilt. And then a last point here that you should not do. Do not tell them that everything will be okay and that everything will be fine. At that moment, when, you, when, when they're opening up, when they're trying to share their pain, you know, when they're sharing their struggles, their suffering, you know, and you're just saying like, oh, buddy, it will all be okay. You know, pfft, don't worry. 
it's literally like that, you know, you're sort of like diminishing it. You're sort of like saying like, you know, it's all going to be fine, you know, it's all going to go away. It's all going to be good. And again, the intent is well meant when people do that. But it is so unhelpful because you're diminishing their problems and what they're currently feeling. And they are currently feeling not okay. And to then say like, oh, but all is going to be fine is not going to be helpful. I think now is the perfect time to actually transfer to the things that you, sh you should do. First point to do focus on is truly listen with the intent to try to understand that person. Don't listen with the intent to respond like most people do when they are in, in a conversation with someone. They just listen so they can respond back. But very few do listen with the intent to just understand what that person is trying to say. And if you wanna help someone with suicidal thoughts, listen with the intent to understand. You really have to do that. And you can ask questions, right, to understand their suffering. And the drop this year now too, I, we have created actually on the IPS project a video on the YouTube channel of the IPS project uh, on how to have more meaningful conversation. But basically what the video talks about, how to have more meaningful conversations with someone. And one of the ways is by asking, you know, by not asking questions where you can simply answer yes or no on. For example, one is, are you feeling good? Where you can just simply say yes or no, and that ends the conversation, right? A better way of formulating questions would be using how, what, where, um, and when, you know? For example, right, as how are you feeling today? You can't answer that by simply a yes or no, right? You have to give more to answer that. So I would recommend that video to watch that video because it truly teaches some good fundamental ways to learn to actively listen, but also to learn how to better ask questions, which are fundamental to truly want to understand someone. So it will be linked in the description of this video. All right, let's go to the next do. Have empathy, you know, have and show empathy. For example, like in the first part of this video, when I was explaining why I had suicidal thoughts, how those thoughts started to develop, it might be very hard when you are not in high school, you know, I don't know, of course, your age or, you know, who is watching this right now, but if you are not in high school and you're somewhat older, uh, or if you're not a guy or, or, you know, or you didn't lose your dad, for example, if you just listen only just to what I was, was sharing, just like that alone, just listening to what I was sharing, you're not completely gonna exactly understand how painful it was. Unless you position yourself into who I was, you know, into being a 12 year old and having no dads, being a short guy, not fitting into the school system, all those things that I shared there, yeah? Like really putting yourself into my skin, into that moment. You are more likely to understand why those thoughts might come to develop. And that's the same when you are going to talk with someone, try to really have empathy, try to really put yourself in their position because that's the only way to truly truly understand and to show empathy as well you know which you can only do if you feel what they're feeling and then a last do that is really essential is to be non-judgmental or uh, to have a positive acceptance do not judge them for anything that they've done Maybe they have abused alcohol or drugs or did self-injury or are still doing those one of those things to regulate their emotions. Don't judge them for any behavior that you might not agree with. Uh, and this approach, you know, to be non-judgmental and to have a positive acceptance towards them doesn't mean that you agree, right, what they do, but it means that you don't push them away from you by saying like, oh, should you have really done that? Or that doesn't seem good to me to do. That's more of a negative thing 
to do. And also what this means is to go on their face. So you want them to probably already, you know, jump out of this hole, but you can't, like I already stated here in this video, you can't force someone to make a move. They have to make that move themselves. So maybe you want them to go to a therapist, but they might not be ready themselves. Work on their face, walk on their face. That's really important. And don't try to push them into anything that they are not ready yet for. And, you know, basically just accept who they are and how they think. They might think different than you, but don't try to change them. So these are the, the do's that are really important to do. <laughs> and the do nots really try to aim you know, really take them in and really, yeah, try to not do them. When you go and have this conversation with that person, 80% of the conversation will probably be more around just the why until there. And that's within the, on the suicide line, the same. You focus 80% on here, on the why and, you know, that there. It, understanding the hole that they're in. And let me go back now to... A previous illustration and as I said uh, that we were coming back to the blue dots and now is the moment to come back to the, the blue dots because you can still feel like how do I help that person the blue dots are basically the reason that people do not commit suicides or that people get out of those thoughts and if we look at the biggest one here so that is 30 for wanting to live and hoping for a better future. But the second one, the second biggest one here is getting support. And I think you can maybe now see by hearing the biggest, the second biggest one on how you can be there for someone and how you can help them get out. It's simply by giving them support and by just being there, by just listening with Everything, you know, with the approaches here of the do's that we learned, listening with intent to understand, having empathy, showing empathy, and being non-judgmental and having a positive acceptance towards who they are. Just being there for them, just in the present, taking your time. Because if we look at the biggest red dot here, the biggest reason why people start to have suicidal thoughts, it's loneliness, right? What is one way to get a reduction in loneliness is by having people around you, by having someone who understands you. Loneliness, another word for that is feeling like no one understands you. When you give someone support, you know, from your heart out with the real intent to want to be there for them, people will also feel that. And loneliness will decrease and with that, you know, thoughts will also decrease. Suicidal thoughts will also decrease. And then it's kind of connected, right? Because getting support uh, and the hope for a better future, they're quite connected in the way that when you can give someone support, their hope for a better future, you know, the future becomes brighter because they also start to feel less lonely. If you want to help someone, just care just care just talk to them just show that you want to be there for them just give support that is many times the solution and let me just also cover the other uh, blue dots here the other biggest one here is uh, which is well 27 percent literally translated this is thinking about your surrounding, the people that they care about. And when you actually start moving upwards here to the reason of living, what has stopped them so far uh, from not taking their life yet? Once you get to that point, ask them, what are you still living for? Those reasons could be their children, uh, their dog, their cat, uh, their boyfriend, girlfriend, their parents, it could be other things, right? But what is keeping them still here? From there on, you can slowly start to build up until a solution and a solution could be a therapist. If we will go back now to the other uh, dot here, this is um, having the support from a 
professional. I mean, therapy, that's where they can focus more on resolving and healing inner wounds that they're struggling with or that have been caused in the past and yeah, starting to heal them. Solution can be other things, you know, it can be a variety. It will not just alone be a therapist. It will be a combination of a couple of things, right? It could be finding a purpose. For example, with me, the IPS project, creating that really gave meaning to my life and a purpose. Uh, but it could also traveling, for example, uh, and just getting out of the environment that they're in that could 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 have been abusive or just very toxic solution is very personal um it, it's very different for everyone's solution uh, but it will not be just one thing mostly it is a couple of things and it, the solution itself there are relapses right to working towards the solution and and getting out of this hole you can even sometimes fall back a little bit, some steps. It's not just a straight line, like nothing is in life. It's up and downs, as long as you're making slow progress to getting out of it. But mainly, the thing to focus on, and I'm gonna say it again, because this can, you know, feel very overwhelming. All this information, I've thrown so much information at you now, right? But if I could just simplify it to just one thing, is to just walk up to that person and drop the word suicide and just sit down with them and listen, understand, be there and give them support. With that, I hope I was able to offer you some useful information here and that you're walking away from this video truly feeling like you do know more about suicide and understand the topic better uh, but also then of course that you feel like you know better now how to help someone with these thoughts like i said in the beginning do check the description because you know if you want to educate yourself more on the topic of suicide then the podcast episodes that i mentioned in the beginning can be found there and i'm gonna insert some other additional helpful uh, and also the video that i was mentioning about how to have meaningful conversations and i'm gonna insert other videos and interviews and articles anything else that i can think of that i truly know will help you more on this topic of suicide can be found there so check the descriptions i want to thank you again for you know if you watch this whole video up until here then you make my heart smile you make me smile just the thought that someone watched this video all the way until here makes me really happy uh, it makes me hopeful together we can fight this suicide that we can together but it has to come from all of us together right from me from you from everyone right but together we can make a decrease and a real impact and a real change beautiful people that take their own life we can stop that you know but it has to come from all of us together and so i'm so happy and so grateful that you watched this video all the way here until the end because this really is going to help to make a change. So, thank you. Thank you so much.